political groups in um, Jerusalem. He has um, a long time activist in the, Israeli, in the Israeli left, even before I was, became an activist. So it's quite a long time ago. And he's the founder of ICAD, which is the Israeli Committee Against House Demolition. And he... Derived. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so here we've got now Jeff, and I was just saying, Jeff, that I, I used to be your neighbor many years ago in Jerusalem. Yeah. And um, I, um, I know you from Stop the Occupation and other things like that, similar organization. And um, I was saying that you are a very long ter term activist in the Israeli left and a founder of ICAD, which is the Israeli Committee Against House Demolition. Right. And um, the other thing, he was nominated to a Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize, and an author of a number of books, including An Israeli in Palestine, A War Against the People, and the current one that we are discussing at the moment, which is Decolonizing Israel, Liberating Palestine. And um, this is Jeff. Uh, now, um, Roland is going to be uh, asking Jeff some questions during the, uh, today. And uh, Roland is another long-term activist in, of the left, especially about Palestine. And um, he has written quite a lot of articles on the subject and contributed to a number of books. So, um, and has spoken to in many events and other things like that, many public meetings. So I suggest that we are going to start now. And um, the first um, uh, to start is Roland is going to have questions for Jeff. Okay, thank, thank you. I'm really pleased to have you with us, Jeff. Uh, unfortunately, I only got a copy of your book yesterday, so I've only had a chance to read half of it. But I know your work, I know your other writings. Uh, so I. I don't know that I can guess what you're saying, but I have a, a quite a good understanding of where you're coming from. Uh, and from the half that I've read so far, it seems to me that your, your book does a really good job of summarizing many of the academic discussions in a re very readable way. Many, many of the academic discussions about the nature of the Israeli state and the Israeli occupation since 1967 are putting it in the context of a settler colonial analysis of the situation and of breaking from the framework of uh, a two-state so-called solution to the, uh, the problem. One of the things that interests me, and you mentioned early in the book, is that you went to Israel in the 1970s as a Zionist, and the, the pressure of events that you witnessed and experienced there uh, changed your whole outlook. So I think it will be very interesting if you, if you explain to us how the reality of Israel affected your political development uh, and what this means for an analysis of Israeli society and the Israeli occupation, the Israeli occupation since 1948 of Palestine. All right, thank you very much all of you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, you know, my story is not quite that dramatic a Zionist who becomes uh, disillusioned and finds his way to the left. I mean, I've always been to the left. I'm a, it's not like many of you, I'm a child of the 60s. And uh, I was very involved in the civil rights movement in the States. I was very involved in the anti-war movement and, and so on. You know, part of the 60s that people forget was the identity politics. You know, you had Alex Haley's uh, roots so the African-Americans were really the first ones that began to question the melting pot and begin to reclaim their ethnic uh, heritage, um, followed by you know, Cesar Chavez and um, you know, the, the American Indian movement, AIM, Russell Mead and Vine Deloria. And I got caught up in that whole thing. Even the white middle-class kids, <laughs> you know, who were the, you know, do, invented a culture culture in order to give their lives some substance, something where you know, they had their own music, their own foods, their own drugs, their own uh, neighborhoods. Uh, so I got caught up in all of that and, and, my, and my Jewish identity became important to me in that sense of, of an identity. 
in a way, a kind of a rejection of anything of American, white American. I come from Minnesota, which was about as white as you could possibly get. Um, but, you know, I'm not religious. And there was very little that I could, I could, you know, be Jewish, I could build that around. And so in a sense, with that identity shift, I in a way became an Israeli before I ever went to Israel. And not out of a Zionist idea, but more, again, out of this idea of going back to identity and roots and all of that. And that led me here. But I came actually as an anti-Zionist. That's the weird part of it. I moved to Israel as an anti-Zionist. I mean, the first thing I did was to join Siach, which was the Israeli New Left, and began to work you know, with Palestinians uh, because I didn't see a contradiction between my feelings of identity in the country uh, and, uh, and um, um, you know, the Palestinians uh, right here. I mean, I, I realized everything that was happening, but in a sense, I, 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 maybe I could say that I, I found this a more meaningful uh, sphere of battle for myself, of struggle, than being in the States. In the States, I'm sure I would have been an activist and I would have been involved. But here, I think I felt that um, maybe the, the struggle here was a little more, you could get your hands on it more. It was more immediate to me, it was more important to me. And, uh, and so in a sense, I, I shifted one arena of struggle to another, but that reflected a shift of identity. But I've never been really, I've never been a Zionist. Uh, I mean, I understand where it's coming from, and I write about it in the book so, uh, a bit, but if, if there is a Zionist thread in me or whatever, I write about it in the book a little bit, it's what's called cultural Zionism. That was a, a minority uh, intellectual uh, stream uh, before 1948 of Jewish intellectuals who said, yes, we want to come back to our homeland, we want to revive our culture, our language, but we can do that together with the Palestinians and develop our national identities in, in tandem. So in a sense, uh, that's, that's more the story rather than, uh, than the simpler one of uh, becoming disillusioned. I was always disillusioned, but, but, uh, but I felt that the struggle was meaningful. That makes Sorry, sense. I was muted I, I there. I, I... I thought that you said in the beginning of the book that you went there as a, an anti-occupation left Zionist. But it's interesting that you mentioned Siach, because I went to Israel in 1971 as a young left Zionist. And one of the first people I met there was Reuven Kaminer, who was Dean of Foreign Students at the Jerusalem University, and who was the founder of Siach. So I, I, mean, I never adopted those politics, but I, I certainly... Uh, Reuven was somebody who, who influenced me profoundly from my very early days in Israel. But um, I went to Israel as a Zionist, and I was politicized by the events and the people that I met there. And um, crucially, two things for me, the 1973 war and trying to understand why it happened, and even more centrally, encountering the Israeli Black Panther movement and the movement of Mizrahi Jews. And I think it will be interesting. I mean, you, you refer to this uh, several times in, in your latest book. And it will be very interesting to hear your analysis of the way in which Arab Jews were de-Arabized and turned into Israelis and what the, the um, implications this has for resolving the conflict. Yeah, you know, the uh, hope had always been that the Arab Jews or Mizrahi Jews, as they're called today, a Dota Mizrach, we used to call them, um, you know, Jews who come from Muslim, mainly Muslim countries, um, would be a kind of a bridge between the uh, Israeli Jewish Ashkenazi population and the, and the Arabs, you know, whether it's the Palestinians or the wider Arab world. And that, of course, didn't happen. And I was very involved with the Black Panthers. I was pretty involved, although that was just when I came to the country. Um, but I was very involved in, uh, about 10 years later, there was another Mizrahi movement called the Ohel movement, or the movement of tents, um, that, um, that I was, I was really very much involved with. 
And in a sense, I think, you know, what happened to the Mizrahim was they, um, you know, they came to this country uh, and there was kind of a deal that was struck. I mean, it wasn't, they didn't have a say in it, but this was a deal that we will accept you and integrate you into Israeli society if you give up everything Arab. <laughs> you know, I mean, 2,000 years or more they've lived in the Arab world. You know, if you give up your Arabic language, you give up the music, you give up, uh, certainly you wouldn't call yourself an Arab Jew. You know, you just completely reject that. And in a sense, there was really an attempt, and it succeeded, to, to construct a kind of a Mizrahi standalone identity box. So that on the one hand, you're rejecting Ashkenazi Jews, European Jews, but on the other hand, you're rejecting the Arab world that you came from. And I have to say that until today, with a young generation of militant Mizrahi Jews, you have that same thing. They're, they're you know, it's, it's strange because they're militant. You know, they're talking about the poor people. They're talking about social justice, all these sorts of things. But they're in the Likud. <laughs> or they're in the right wing because... They bought this anti anti Arab uh, kind of a thing, and what happened, of course, was that um, that the deal the, the the Ashkenazi Jews in power never fulfilled the deal. They de Arabized the Arab Jews. Um, they didn't even call them Israeli Jews. They called them uh, Sephardic Jews. You know, coming out of Spain, um, Middle Eastern music, for example, isn't called Mizrahi music. It's called Greek or Mediterranean music, you know? So in every sense, they were scrubbed of anything Arab, but they weren't accepted. They weren't really taken into Israeli society. For the most part, the Mizrahi Jews today are the working classes uh, in Israel. And, and the, 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 the correlation between class and ethnicity is very, very strong here. And so in a sense, uh, the Black Panthers and the Ohel movement were attempt to to change that. But when that failed, and it did fail, um, because you can't underestimate, still the Mizrahi Jews were kind of religious or traditional and very Jewish. And there was only, you know, it was only a certain distance that they would go from the rest of the Israeli population. And so what happened instead is you had the rise of the Shas movement in the late 1970s, which is the, an ultra-Orthodox Sephardic Mizrahi Jewish movement, you know, of the same people, largely Moroccan Jews to, to, to a great extent. So the Shas movement until today, uh, you know, has uh, members of the parliament and it's strong and they have their own school system and they dress just like Ashkenazi Jews. They have white shirts and the whole Ashkenazi outfit, but they call themselves uh, Sephardim. And so it, it's, a, you know, I think it, uh, it really shows in a sense, um, you know, how, to what degree, and that's something you have to really deal with, to what degree solidarity with this Jewish identity in Israel really overcomes to a large degree your ethnic identity, your class status or whatever. And it only allows a certain amount of diversion and then everybody's really within the same box. Yeah, my, my experience was a diff, bit different than yours. In fact, it was only when I went to Israel that I realized how British I was rather than how <laughs> Jewish or Israeli that I was. So it was very important to me as well. But um, in the 1980s, I was coordinator of a project which was sending volunteers to work in Palestine. Mm -hmm. and meant to work for a year in Palestinian communities. And most of the places that we were, were working with were Palestinian communities in the state of Israel, which is, I think, the most neglected part of the Palestinian people, uh, written out of most accounts, both from Israeli and from Palestinian perspectives. And I also suspect that they would be the biggest losers in any attempt to resolve the conflict through a two-state solution. Uh, and I'd be interested, I'm sure that other comrades will be interested in what you have to say about the struggle of Palestinian citizens of Israel and what this has to say about the whole issue. Well, you know, there's is a real kind of ambivalence here. You know, I'm, 
you know, I'm involved, and this was the basis of the book, in a Palestinian-led campaign that's called the One Democratic State Campaign. Where we're, and the book really, uh, the second half of the book, the first half gets into the settler colonial because it, these are Palestinians and some Israeli Jews who define this as a colonial, settler colonial movement, and therefore we have to decolonize. And our plan of decolonization, we have a 10 point plan of decolonizing and creating one uh, a democratic state of equal rights for everyone between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. And uh, it's significant that this initiative really began with what we call 48 Palestinians. Palestinians, you know, that are citizens of Israel. Because in many ways, you know, they're the ones that are sumud. They're the ones that stayed. And, uh, and they have a certain moral, I think a certain moral status within the Palestinian community. You know, this is the kind of the heartland of the, of the Palestinians. Uh, and um, at the same time, interestingly, as Israelis, they have more political space to maneuver and organize than Palestinians in the occupied territory or Palestinians in refugee camps. You know, because as Israelis, I mean, even the second class Israelis, they still have a certain amount of, of political space uh, to do that. What's interesting is that um, that the one state idea that was accepted by the PLO from the beginning um, is, is a hard sell, even among Palestinians today. And I would say that for 48 Palestinians, citizens of Israel, today, a lot of them, I think, a, first of all, see the one state as somewhat utopian, don't really see a path to a single state politically, and, and I think that they're, they're uh, it's like the Mizrahim in a way. I mean, you know, if that channel is cut off, then uh, your only option is to try to integrate as much as you can in, into Israel. So that, uh, you know, they're represented by the joint Arab list, which is four Arab parties. I mean, they've kind of split a little bit, but four, four we call them Arab parties. We don't use the word Palestinian for uh, Palestinians in Israel. Um, uh, you know, around the, the main party being the Communist Party, of course, being Hadash, but the joint Arab list will not even entertain the idea of a single state. They're very much, I mean, it's ironic that the only party left in the parliament, in the Knesset, that supports a two-state idea is the Arab party, the joint Arab list, the, you know, headed by the communists. And I think it reflects, uh, you know, this feeling that, um, you know, we're, they're beginning to be a critical mass within Israel. They're more than 20%. Uh, they're getting to be a real, here, Netanyahu in the election coming up, Netanyahu is wooing them. It's, they're beginning to be, you know, instead of a, a situation, even in the last election, where uh, Gantz and the, you know, could have been prime minister with his blue-white party, if he had brought in the joint Arab list that recommended him for prime minister. This is the guy that destroyed, this is the guy the ICC, ICC is bringing up now uh, for trial in The Hague because of his crimes in Gaza. He was endorsed by the joint Arab list to be prime minister. And he gave that up because he didn't want to be with Arabs. I mean, he gave up being prime minister because that's, that's beginning to change now because uh, they're beginning to be enough of a block it, it's getting harder and harder to set up a government without them as a, as a swing vote. So I think in that dynamic, you know, right now at least, they're heading towards trying to integrate into Israel more than, more than a, a working, you know, a, you know, supporting the one state idea. So we have a tough sell uh, among Palestinians, not only among, you know, with everybody else. Okay, well, I was actually going to ask you something about the joint list, but it, it's important to note that it was not all of the joint list that endorsed Gantz as prime minister. The, the, the Ballard group actually refused to nominate him as prime minister. But um, we've, we've got elections coming up soon in Israel. There'll be the fourth elections in two years. Now, my analysis of the last election was that um, the parliament, in a parliament of 120, 
uh, we ended up with a hundred or so right and centre-right Zionists, a handful of left anti-occupation Zionists, and about 15 from the non-Zionist um, joint list, which, right. as you say, has split now with uh, right. the um, more conservative Arab party um, stepping aside. I think they stepped aside over support for gay rights, actually. Uh, and the other parties refused to compromise on this. Uh, and they're also uh, willing to join Netanyahu. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to join Netanyahu indeed. Uh, so, uh, uh, but previously in one of the previous elections, I can't remember how many, which election it was, but there has been serious debates among Palestinian citizens of Israel about whether they should participate in elections at all. That's right. And as you say, they're now more than 20% of the population. Um, theoretically, they should have something like 25 seats, 25 to 30 seats in the parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually have 15 or so. But the uh, relative success of the joint list in the last election was a big step forward for um, the significance of the Arab communities, the Palestinian communities in Israel. Uh, going back a second, also, there, there were some 10 years ago, a series of significant documents coming from Palestinian intellectuals in Israel on rejection of Zionism and rejection of, of the Zionist two-state framework. But it will be very interesting to hear um, your assessment of whether the elections offer anything for Palestinians in Israel. I mean, obviously, most, half the people living under Israeli rule have no political rights at all. That's but right. the, the Palestinian citizens of Israel do have some democratic rights. It would be interesting to hear what you think of the, the prospects in the election, whether it is of any relevance at all in this situation. I don't think it's really much relevance. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I think the Arab community in Israel, the Palestinian community in Israel, really went all out in the last election. And the joint Arab list got 15 seats. And, and they, they, like I said, they could have made a difference, but they were rejected. And I think that's, that's really uh, disillusioned the, you know, a lot of the Palestinians inside Israel. According to the polls now, uh, the joint Arab list, in other words, the three parties that remain, plus the one party that broke away that's running independently, the Islamic party, um, you know, might get, you know, the, uh, I mean, the Islamic party is not sure they'll get in at all. So they'll get between nine and uh, 13 seats, down from 15. So it really shows that, um, that there's been a decline in support among the Palestinians for the joint era, for, uh, not for, the, for you know, participating in elections at all. I think a lot of people uh, in that community have simply given up on, on, on Israeli elections and they see themselves as being used and and so on. So, uh, um, you know, what we're hoping is um, that, uh, you know, as, you know, our movement for one democratic state is growing among Palestinians, both within Israel, in the, in the occupied territory, we're in touch with people in the camps, and with the diaspora, of course. Um, and our hope is that if we can, if we can begin to really get some meaningful support, and there's, I think there's a lot of support among the civil society in the world, international uh, civil society for this, and we can begin to show the Palestinians that this isn't utopian, that really if we organize and mobilize with the allies we have abroad like you guys, um, that we really can become political actors in a, in a, in a real sense, um, that that will begin to change things. Because I think the Palestinians are pretty desperate for change, certainly in the occupied territory, but also in Israel. They see that, um, that uh, there's no way in which they're really ever going to be, you know, and, and of course, don't forget in 2018, the parliament passed the Jewish Nationalities Law that really officially made the Arabs in Israel, the Palestinians, second-class citizens, uh, reducing their language, reducing their legal rights. So uh, I don't think they have any illusions. I think it's really a matter of real politique, you know, for a, a minority community has to really look around and say, nothing's really good for us. What is the best way to go at this moment that we can protect ourselves 
maybe get some of our grievances met or whatever. And until we can show that the one state solution is meaningful and real and could really succeed, they're not gonna go that direction. They're, they're gonna try to work with the powers that be, that, that they're dependent on. Uh, we've spoken mainly about the themes of your latest book and about what's going on largely mm -hmm. in Israeli society, but I'd like to turn for a bit to, I think what you're best known for here and internationally is your work in the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions mm -hmm. and for the whole concept of the matrix of control that you came up with. Um, maybe you can say something about that. Well, it, it, it feeds into the book. Um, you know, what, what, behind the matrix as well, you know, we talk all the time about the, a conflict, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but it's not a conflict. You know, a conflict has two or more sides and you fight about something and the way you resolve a conflict is they come together and you compromise, you negotiate, and you come up with some kind of a, of a solution. But Zionism, and this is what's important, is a form of settler colonialism. Uh, much like the British in um, Kenya, you know, like South Africa, like the US, Canada, Australia. Um, it's a, uh, you know, the French in Algeria. And a settler colonial movement is unilateral. It's when one foreign population comes into a country with the intent of taking it over. It's, it's you know, and, and every settler colonial movement invents a narrative about why they're entitled to the country, why it belongs to them and not to the indigenous population. Uh, so that the, the Palestinians for Zionism aren't a side. <laughs> they have no rights. Israel until today hasn't, has never recognized their, their actual existence as a people, let alone their national rights. And so the whole thing is unilateral. The word that we use here that's very useful actually, that we don't hear much in public in the discourse is to Judaize. Zionism came to Judaize Palestine. In other words, to transform an Arab country into a Jewish country. Not 78% of it. <laughs> Not the little place where the Palestinians can have a say that there aren't Palestinians. There are Arabs who are intruders and they're a problem. What do you do with them? You eliminate them. That's the language of settler colonialism. You eliminate the indigenous. You either kill them, which happens, or you expel them, which has happened to more than half the Palestinian people, or you confine them to little tiny Bantu stands, which Israel has done. And uh, so the point is that there is no occupation. I mean, there is an occupation in a legal sense, you know, so you can use that, that concept, but there's no occupation of this sense that Israel does not see the West Bank and Gaza and certainly East Jerusalem as a foreign territory that was taken over and that you can negotiate away or give back. This is our country, 100% of it. And so the, the problem for Israel is how to transform an occupation, which is defined in international law as a temporary military situation. How do you transform a, um, a, an occupation into a permanent fact on the ground? And the way you do that, and the way you do that is a, a through what I call the matrix of control. In other words, you you create a system in which you begin to incorporate the territory uh, in your legal system and your planning frameworks and so on. So that, so that uh, the, the West Bank is run by the civil administration, not the army. It is run by the army, but under the guise of the civil administration, which pretends to be civilian. Normal administration, you see, houses are demolished by plan, there's planning committees and there's procedures for getting building permits that don't work, they're Kafka-esque, but it's important that those procedures are in place. There's a legal system, Palestinians have access to the courts. Of course, they can never win, but, but that doesn't matter. So the point is you're creating a permanent matrix of control, whether it's taking the land 
uh, putting up, uh, you know, fragmenting the land, blocking movements, controlling the economy, um, you know, demolishing homes, uh, uh, displacing people. You're doing that in order to uh, turn the occupation into a permanent fact of life. Don't forget that Galilee was given to the Palestinian state in 1947. And it was conquered by, Is by the UN, and it was conquered by Israel in 1948. But today, even the Palestinians consider the Galilee as a part of Israel. When Arafat was uh, recognized the two-state solution in 1988, he didn't go back to 47 and say, we want our 56% of the country. He said, we'll just take the 22%. In other words, Israel managed to conquer 22% of Palestine beyond what the UN had given it, and that's become normalized. Even the Palestinians have internalized that. And that's the same process that Israel's trying to do with the occupation. So more and more, you even notice it maybe in your country, more and more people don't even use the word occupation. I mean, I don't think I've heard the word occupation for 10 years in Israel. It's a non-issue. We don't talk about it. It's not an electoral, electoral issue. And, uh, you know, uh, with donors, for example, donors that are giving to Palestinian organizations or organizations like ours today, it used to be that you couldn't say BDS. And the UN, the EU, church groups, you know, wouldn't give you money if you were a BDS. Now, uh, then you couldn't use the word apartheid. Now, in many cases, I'm telling you, if you use the word occupation, these liberal humanitarian groups, human rights groups, won't give you money. So there's been that erosion. And I think Israel feels that uh, simply the every, you know, turning it in, transforming it into an everyday fact, you know, and uh, this is the way it is, and this is how Palestinians live. House demolitions, you know, Israel's demolished about 60,000 houses homes of Palestinians just in the occupied territory since 1967. Well, that's, that, was a big, that was big news in the beginning. Today, you can demolish uh, uh, 40 houses in the Jordan Valley, and it's not, in the new, not even in the Israeli news, because it's not news anymore. It becomes a part of the landscape, you see? And that's the, that process. That's where the matrix of control comes in, and that is you take everything and you put a, a, a cover of planning and zoning and bureaucracy and administration over it. You make it routine every day. You stifle any kind of resistance. And then over time, you simply wait and the whole thing becomes accepted. Uh, I mean, you see it with the Trump plan to some degree. Um, so that, that's the strategy of the matrix of control. And that's, that's the end goal of settler colonialism is, you know, you don't want to stay a colonial state. You want your, your colonial entity to become normal. So to be an American, you know, there were just a, a one example, you know, in, um, uh, well, it was a big event in the States, a left event, I'm trying, I'm blocking right now, but they sang, the song that was sung is Woody Guthrie's, this land is your land, this land is my land. And everybody was very happy, you know, the, well, the Native Americans said, hey, wait a minute. What do you mean this land is your land? <laughs> you see, in other words, even the left people in the States have forgotten that the United States is a settler colonial. You know, the Native Americans had to say to them, hey, you guys, wait a minute here. So that's, that's what settler colonial attempts, colonization attempts to do in the end is to normalize the situation. I think Israel feels that it's well on the way to doing that. Those of us who are still managing to hang on in the Labour Party here could well be expelled for saying much of what you've been saying today. But I, I, I think it's time now for Imbar to open it for audience contribution, comrades contributions. Okay, so first of all, apologies about the yawning. There were, were a few too many Zoom meetings today. Okay, um, can I have to, can I ask people for put their hands up for contributions or for sh either a uh, short contribution, I have to state, or questions. Questions may be good to have first, if it's possible. 
okay? If you, by any chance, change your name and you don't want to have it visible, then you can put it in the chat. I'm just reminding people that we're recording the meeting, and if you wanted by any chance to not to be present, um, you can change your name and uh, take your picture off. And you can put a question in the chat, okay? So can I have some hands, please? One second, I need to change something here. Yeah. Okay, I can't see any hands at the moment. Oh yes, Neil. Okay. Um, you like to unmute? Yes. I think I'm unmuted, aren't I? Yes. Yes, I yes you are. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I mean, thank you very much um, indeed for that, uh, Jeff. I, I I just want to I want to get your response really to. Uh, to, to, to this point, I mean, I was very taken with your idea of the matrix of control and the way in which the occupation, colonialism becomes uh, normalized and how fundamental that is really to the project that is going on um, in Israel. But it's also true, it seems to me that there's, it, I mean, it can go up and down, at least in terms of international solidarity. So I can remember that in the wake of the anti-war movement in the early uh, noughties, um, the Palestinian, there was a real shift in Britain. I don't know what it was like in the States, but in Britain, there was a real shift against Israel and towards Palestine. And it was possible for the Stop the War movement here to be part of supporting, organizing, building really very, very big pro-solidarity, uh, Palestinian solidarity mobilizations and now of course I mean Roland has, has, has touched on this just now it's shifted right right back and we've got a situation where there's a kind of witch hunt kind of atmosphere in relation to people who raise the question of the occupation who accuse Israel of being an apartheid state and so on so we've had that really dramatic shift I just wonder if you've got any comment really on what's happening in the States and how you would interpret those kinds of shifts in the way in which Palestinian uh, solidarity um, is, uh, is seen in the wider movement. No, that's a very good uh, point, very good issue. I don't see it as a shift. I see it, I see it somewhat differently. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, uh, and that's how we're trying to convince the Palestinians that this is a real political initiative the one state idea, not just utopia. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you look at South Africa, uh, you know, the ANC was, was facing a similar situation to the Palestinians in some ways. In other words, you had a dominant population running the country that was not going to dismantle apartheid. You had a government that was hostile to you. You had international governments hostile to you. I mean, uh, Thatcher called Mandela a terrorist and so on. And the only real allies of the, of the ANC were, you, were us, the international civil society. You know, and, and so their strategy was to bypass governments, bypass their own, the, the white population, bypass their own government, and go directly to us. And all of us at a certain age were active in the anti-apartheid movement. And we were very important in, in, in helping the ANC bring down apartheid. So what, we're, what I, we're trying to tell the Palestinians, you see, I think even the Palestinians, look, they're kind of isolated. And I think one, you know, I have some criticism of the PSC and, and pro-Palestinian groups all over the world in that they're doing good work at home, but they're not in touch with the Palestinians very much. So the Palestinians here, wherever they are, in Israel or in the occupied territory or the camps or wherever, feel, feel very isolated and besieged, but, you know, and understandably so. You got the Israeli army in their head. They got this collaborationist PA on their head. You know, they're trying to survive. They're losing their lands. They're losing their livelihoods. And they don't see the, the amount of you support that you're talking about in the international civil society. They don't see BDS campaigns. They don't see the lobbying. They don't see the organizations, the churches getting involved. They don't, they don't know that. And so for them, you know, Israel is this all powerful entity. 
Now, my view, just to relate to your question, is that, that Israel is losing it in the court of public opinion. Israel is strong with governments, true, for all kinds of reasons I write about in the war against the people. Israel is not strong among the people. And I think that's, instead of a shift, what I would say is that this is, this is, these are signs of desperation. When they're going after Jeremy Corbyn, they're going after you guys in the Labor Party. They're, you know, this anti-Semitic stuff, the, the, the panic over BDS. It really is a panic. Now the ICC. I mean, I think Israel's back is to the wall and they're not getting support. They're, so, the, so in other words, I don't think it's a shift. I think it's a, it's a last ditch attempt to marshal government and parties and the establishment against the people. But I think Israel feels that it's losing. And if we can communicate that to the Palestinians, the fact that they have support, and that if we mobilize strategically the international civil society, that's a tremendous source of, of strength for us, then I think we can begin to convince them that this isn't utopian. So yes. I wouldn't see it as a shift. I would see it as, I think, in the way I present it. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I was going to say, what um we are going to do it. We are going to have a few contributions and then Jeff comes back next, okay? Uh, because in the other ones, it will take a long time. So um, the next uh, two speakers are Susan. Are you still want to speak? Uh, Susan, if we can have only a few minutes, please. Not even that. I was just going to say exactly what Jeff said. What we're seeing, this attack, this, this witch hunt, this attack on anti-Zionist Jews, this attack on Jews that are questioning. It's a sign of Israeli weakness, not That's strength. Exactly. The only reason that they're doing this is because they know there is no way to justify what they're doing. So if you look at the US, that's a very interesting thing because what we see in the US is American Jews backing off. We see the revival of a, of a Jewish left, an anti-Zionist or at least a non-Zionist Jewish left, which I'm so happy to see, I can't tell you. And what the thing that's happening because of that is that we then have governments coming down. We have that, that, that schmuck Schumer in New York who's sitting there saying, oh no, we have to block stop this. So it's actually governments, not the people that support them. And this is the point, I agree so much with what Jeff said, getting the Palestinians to understand, hold it, you've got the support. It's them and that's why they're pushing so hard. And, and you know, look, at, look at the reactions on the, uh, on the vaccines, not going to the West Bank and Gaza. People have been furious and it's gone through everywhere. This is, this is like, it is more than eugenics. So it's a, we, I think this is the point. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> I agree. Yes, thank you. Um, Tariq, just before you, um, uh, or after, I don't mind, you, you go ahead and I'll ask somebody on somebody else's behalf a question. No, no, go ahead. I, I think it was but more of a statement. We, no, no, I, I'm saying Terry is going to speak. Yeah, after yeah. Okay. Terry, we've okay. got, I've got another question on somebody else's behalf. Okay. Thanks, Imba. Um, yeah, I mean, Susan said, Jeff and Susan said some of what I wanted to say about the the strength of the BDS movement and, and why the reaction is so fierce from the establishment. But I, I, I guess my other question is, what is the feeling amongst the organisations you work with about the the governmental politics in the states and in particular what's your expectations from the Biden administration mm -hmm. with that changing the mood on the ground as distinct from Trump obviously we saw the Trump plan which you mentioned in passing um but you know what do you think the impact of Biden who has not exactly been a friend to the Palestinian people, uh, to put it mildly. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I've got two questions. One of them is very short. How will you convince Israeli, Jewish Israelis to share? That's one of them. It's um, a, good, a good question as uh, somebody who knows the, the, the situation. In general, about how do you convince people to share? In general, I think it's a good question not only Israelis and Palestinians, but in general, rich and poor and other things. But um, the other thing is that uh, I would like to hear what um, you, um, Jeff has got to say, things about the situation in South Africa today and how it relates to Palestine. 
from what I understand, the colonist um, population still keeps the property and businesses they've had during apartheid and indigenous people feel as poor as before. This is interesting. I'm not familiar myself enough with that. Any other questions or? No, go ahead with those questions and then we can come back for others. Sometime a debate can, works better like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Well, I think Susan and I are on the same page, so I won't, I won't respond to that, except she's absolutely right. The, um, you know, the, the, the strongest and most critical anti-Zionist forces emerging in the U.S. are in the Jewish community. You know, Jewish Voice for Peace, which is the largest growing Jewish organization in the United States, especially of young people, uh, last year came out with an explicit anti-Zionist declaration. I mean, I mean, they they define themselves officially and formally in black and white as an anti-Zionist organization. So there's some very interesting developments happening, uh, I think, uh, in 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 you know, the U.S. and I think in the, in Britain too. Except you guys are more under um, under attack than uh, I think in the states. Um, in terms of Biden, you know, it's, it's really sort of what we know. I mean, the Bi Biden has always been very pro-Israel, and Kamala, Har Kamala Harris as well. In fact, the Democrats historically have been more pro-Israel than the Republicans. It's only when you had the rise of the Tea Party and the Christian right that the Republicans started to shift uh, into a, a pro-Israel uh, position. Um, but the Democrats have always been there. So there's nothing to, to look at there, really. But I think there's a change in the young generation, you know, the AOCs uh, and, uh, uh, you know, especially if young Jews, you know, that's where intersectionality comes in. Because as young Jews begin to work with, uh, with um, you know, African Americans and with the Latinos and with Native Americans and with workers and working class people and so on, um, you know, I think they give permission in some ways for a lot of those groups to uh, to speak out about the Palestinian issue. And the Palestinian issue, in my view, has become almost emblematic of oppressed people. You know, I, I, I have friends that were in Standing Rock, you know, in, in the Dakotas when they're building the Keystone Pipeline. And they said the protests there in Standing Rock, where all kinds of groups came together, they, there were more Palestinian flags flying than there were American flags there. Because almost like every group, if you're looking for a lingua franca, all right, you know, I have, I have my black symbols, I have my Native American symbols, I have my leftist symbols, I have my women's symbols, I have my, my uh, uh, you know, uh, LBTQ symbols and so on. But if you're looking for a symbol that kind of unites everybody, you know, not just in the U.S., but internationally in the poor people and, 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 and so on, the Palestinian flag has kind of become that, that symbol. I mean, I think the Palestinians in some ways have become emblematic of uh, the struggles of oppressed people. And in that sense, then, um, you know, the fact that Jews in the U.S. are giving permission <laughs> for everyone else to support Palestinians, and they are as well, it's creating a whole new dynamic. It's percolating up. You don't have it yet in the Schumers, but you certainly have it in the young generation of the AOCs and the younger members of Congress. You're beginning to see it very much. Um, so I don't think there's much to look at from the, from the Biden government, but again, I think we can't measure how well we're doing by governments. We have to look more at, at how we're doing with the people. And then we have to be strategic and figure out now, how do we mobilize people power into political power? And the problem we have with the Palestinian issue is that we don't have an end game. So you can't be in a political struggle without an end game. In South Africa, when we were all boycotting the apartheid government, we all had the end game in mind. It was one person, one vote. And that was it. You know, the clerk comes to Mandela and makes a million kinds of offers. And Mandela said, one person, one vote. And, and that we were all united around that. With Palestine, some people are for two states. 
There's talks about confederations, a few people talk about one state, a lot of people don't see any solution or there's no solution for another two generations or whatever, so that you, you can't mobilize in that way. So what we're trying to do in our group is to insert a clear, compelling political program, an end game into the equation that then everyone can mobilize around. And that gives us a direction and the focus that, that I think we're, we're lacking today. And then we can begin to go fight the Bidens and the governments, because you can't go, you know, if you think of the PSC in the UK, you guys have a lobby day. So every year the PSC goes to lobby members of, of parliament. Well, what are you telling them? If I'm a member of parliament, I'm gonna to say to you, okay, what do you want? If you have a slogan, you say end the occupation or something like that, that's not that doesn't work. I need a pro I need something to get my 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 hands on, my fingers on, you see. So we have to begin to come with a political program. And that's what we're really working on. Just briefly in terms of uh, of, uh, of Inbar's questions, we're not gonna convince Israeli Jews. You know, I think again, that's very much like South Africa. I mean, you had some whites in South Africa and they were very important to the movement. You know, the support of the anti-apartheid movement and gave it credibility and so on. But the vast majority of whites did not support, obviously. Uh, and 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 wouldn't have worked to to dismantle the, the apartheid regime that they were benefiting from. Israeli Jews are benefiting from this whole colonial situation. Uh, why would they why would they dismantle it? So in a sense, we have to we have to say to ourselves, okay, what do we do when the dominant population isn't with us? And they're not they're never going to be with us. You you could talk to you for a thousand years. I mean, it's a waste of time going around and trying to convince Israelis. I mean, it's a non-issue, first of all. You know, I, you know, just <laughs> a kind of a cute analogy. You know, in my dating days, you know, when I used to date the years and years and years ago, you know, you'd work uh, on, and, and if, the, if the woman would say to you, hey, let's be friends. All right, you know it was over, just go home. There's nowhere to go from there. And that's, that's what it's like with Israeli Jews. I mean, if, if, if she would have said to me, I hate you, okay, I can work with that. There's an emotion there. <laughs> Let me work with that. Once you say, let's be friends, it's over. And that's, in a sense, the way it is with Israelis. You know, if Israelis would say, we hate Arabs, okay, I can work. You care at least one way or another. I can work with that. But Israelis don't even say that. They don't give a shit. They just don't give a shit. It's irrelevant to them. It doesn't mean anything. They don't talk about it. They don't think about it. It's, so there's really nowhere to start. And I think that's the problem that we're facing there. And we have to understand that and, and work around it. And finally, the, uh, you know, South Africa, I think we're very aware of the fact that in South Africa, you know, you had an incomplete liberation. You know, you, the, the, with the World Bank and the, uh, and the IMF, uh, South African black the, the the ANC never got control of the economy, so it was it was completely uh, left powerless to really change things in a meaningful sort of a way, uh, and I think that's that's what we're struggling with now. In our ten point program, we have a website. It's called onestatecampaign.org, and I think that's a that's a real achievement. The fact that we sat down for a couple of years, Palestinians and Israelis. And, uh, you know, not the middle of the road, peace, peace type people. You know, the, our main partners in the Palestinian community are Balad. You know, so, so um, you know, hardcore Palestinians with hardcore Israelis. And we managed to find bridges, you know, and I think we have a very solid 10-point program. But it has to be fleshed out a lot. So, for example, the economic piece of it, we talk about uh, justice and people have access to resources, but a lot of questions, you know, we have to still work out. For example, is it going to be a neoliberal economy? I mean, in a way, what's the point of liberating Palestine and then having a neoliberal economy? So you have one set of elites replacing another set of elites. On the other hand, can you have a socialist economy? 
in a region that would have trouble supporting or the, even the globe that would have trouble supporting? Can you have socialism in one country? You know, there's some real, real questions that we're going to have to deal with over time. And we're working on that to try to really flesh out, to flesh out this program. But I think South Africa is, is in a way a good example for us because again, I think in many ways, there's, there were some common elements that they dealt with successfully, but it's also a cautionary tale because we want to try to avoid the incomplete liberation that, uh, that happened there. Thank you, Jeff. And um, just um, to dispel any myths people have got about I I Israel being a socialist country, it hasn't been that for many, many years. And it has been neoliberal uh, since um, the early 90s, more or less. Um, I just, um, we've got two people here. We've got uh, Roland and we've got Lee. So um, can um, Lee will speak first, I think, because uh, Roland might uh, want to con contribute about that as well. Thanks, Imba. There's a question for, for Jeff. I just got a bit confused there. But on the one hand, you've got this 10-point um, program looks, you know, relatively good. I appreciate there being criticisms of it, but, you know, I'm all for a, you know, a one-state solution, etc. That's good. But you've just said that, you know, you're never going to convince the Israeli po Jewish population. Forget it. You know, that's not going to happen. They benefit from it. Okay. Can you just take us forward to how you would see that 10-point plan being implemented then, if as far as what you've just said, that would effectively be against the will of the, of the Jewish Israeli population? Okay. Should I answer that, or you want to bring another question in first? In bar, what do you? Think? Yeah, you can. Um, I think that if you can um, answer. Um, I, I, sorry, I, I think that if Roland will come back, and then you can answer it. And just to correct it, I didn't say that Israel was ever socialist. I said say. People, some people aren't under the illusion that it used to be socialist, and I said it has never even attempted to say it is socialist after the 90s. It used to have some kind of um, state economy, but it's not socialism. Right. You know, I think the idea, I think the idea that, uh, that we have uh, is that, um, <clears throat> you know, like again, the whites in South Africa were always against, you know, dismantling apartheid and so on. But you simply created a situation where apartheid was unsustainable. I mean, between the internal resistance and strikes, I mean, there was a little bit of a difference in that, a big difference in that the South African, South African economy is much more dependent on black labor than the Israeli economy is dependent on Palestinian labor. But nevertheless, you know, uh, you had the internal resistance, but then you had BDS basically from the outside. So you began to have corporations pull out of South Africa, Ford, a lot of corporations, because they didn't want to be soiled by association with an apartheid regime. And you had the sports boycott that was very, that was very important. And all, you know, so that over time, it simply became unsustainable. And as it became more unsustainable, governments began to change their policies as well. Um, you know, it became harder and harder to call Mandela, who was very popular among the masses, uh, a terrorist, you know? So even the, the politicians against their will began to get, uh, you know, couldn't hold out with a, with a pro-apartheid position. And that's in a sense the process that we have to replicate here. We have to make, you know, Israeli colonialism and apartheid and occupation so soiled. And I think we're, I think we're well on the way. I think we've done that to some degree so soiled that, um, that uh, uh, companies won't want to be a part of it. People, you know, just today, the, um, uh, the Teachers Union of New Zealand <laughs> withdrew from a pension fund that had a strong Elbit uh, uh, element to it. So, um, you know, so I think that can happen. But again, the difference is that the South Africans had an end game. And so everybody knew where they were going. I think we're floundering to some degree because we, we support Palestinians and I think the support is even trickling up into government to some degree and everybody knows what's happening, but nobody, but if you don't have a solution, I mean, politicians aren't gonna take the, the initiative. You know, uh, 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 Boris Johnson or even a sympathetic politician 
to to the Palestinians. Isn't gonna isn't gonna suggest a solution. That has to be the Palestinians. That's their prerogative, you see. And if they're not speaking out and they're not leading, and the only voice you hear is the PA with this stupid two-state idea, then we're all paralyzed in a way. That I think is the big thing that has to change. And once that changes, I really believe that we can create a situation where Israeli colonialism is unsus becomes unsustainable. And then you have the transition, you see? And what was interesting in South Africa was the whites did participate in the transition. You know, once the clerk said it's over and you began to negotiate for a change and the ANC really acted as a, uh, as a government in waiting. You know, so we have to create, I mean, the PLO doesn't exist anymore. The PLO would have been that vehicle. You know, uh, Arafat and Abu Mazen dismantled the PLO. So we have to create a new PLO. Um, and maybe in the next PLO we're creating, it'll be wide enough to include Israelis as well, not only Palestinians. But once you have a vehicle like that with a political program that represents a critical mass of people, you can begin acting like a political actor. And, you, and, and then you mobilize the forces. And now there's another side to talk to. Now there's another political alternative you know, in the wings. And then that leads to a transition in the end. And the transition, uh, again, in the transition, uh, if the white, I think the white South Africans had no choice. And I think if Israeli Jews are in a situation of no choice, but you see the South Africans also had the Freedom Charter and a constitution, a draft constitution that included white people. In other words, the whites saw that they were a part of the new South Africa. Mandela's slogan was, we're all South Africans. So they could participate in the transition, even if they didn't like it, because they saw that it wasn't against them. It was, it was bringing them into the political arena as well as everybody else. And that's, in a sense, what our, what our plan does as well. It's inclusive of Israeli Jews. And we're not talking about a one Palestinian state. We're talking about a, a multicultural democracy of equal rights. And so, and so we could, if we can get to a transition, then we could get to a point where Israeli Jews, even though they don't like it and don't really accept it, could live with it if they had no choice because they're not going to pay a price, really. You know, they're not going to get thrown out of their houses. They're not going to lose their properties. They're not going to you know, suffer economically, you know, it's widening and, and including Palestinians rather than excluding anybody. So that, I think, is the process that we have in mind, uh, moving towards a transition like that. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Roland is going to speak, and uh, does anybody else want to speak? Because uh, I, uh, I just wondered if people who are less familiar with situ the situation or any other questions they've got uh, about it, or people who are more familiar and would like to contribute. Okay, can I speak? Yes, please. Uh, somewhere upstairs, I have a box stuffed with Zionist propaganda from my murky past in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And one of these is a report from a parliamentary delegation sent by Labour Friends of Israel in the 1960s to Israel that came back to Britain and reported that Israel is the world's most nearly perfect social democracy. And even at the time, I thought they can hardly believe this it can't have been based on anything they actually saw with their own eyes. It was based on the propaganda that were given. I mean, in, uh, Israel was never really a social democracy though, though it, it claimed and aspired to be. Um, but what I really want to come back on is this thing about um, Jews have always been among the fiercest opponents of Zionism. Many of us, because we see it as a threat to our own lives and our own existence where we live. And it's not only socialist Jews. It's socialist Jews, of course, but it's also been religious Jews. It's also been liberal Jews. When the Lloyd George government issued the Balfour Declaration, the one cabinet minister to oppose it was the only Jewish cabinet minister who said it was a threat to his position in Britain. Mm -hmm. There have always been Jews, uh, until 1948, a majority of Jews who opposed Zionism as a threat to Jewish life. What we see now, in, not only in the Labour Party, but in the whole attack on anti-Zionism, is, in effect, 
and interference of non-Jews in what has been a centuries-long internal Jewish debate. And that is one of the things that most angers me about it, that it's non-Jews telling us how we're allowed and not allowed to be Jews. And this really, really angers me. Uh, one other thing that I want to raise and that I hope Jeff has something to say about, many of us in this meeting we call ourselves not just socialists, but eco-socialists, that we see that the devastation of the environment caused by capitalism is a huge threat to continued existence of all life on the planet and the planet itself. Uh, I think this has particular relevance for, for what you're saying about a one-state approach and uh, a unitary Palestinian approach. Um, uh, solution to the conflict. I mean, I remember w when I was editing News From Within back back in the late 80s, um, an article by Gidon Spiro on Israel's nuclear weapon, where he was saying Israel can't use a nuclear bomb against Palestinians because do they really believe that a nuclear bomb could devastate Nablus and not Tel Aviv? And we see exactly the same situation with global warming, w with pollution of the atmosphere, w with um, loss of water resources and whatever. So I'd be, I'd, it seems to me that quite apart from any other consideration, it's impossible to address not just climate change, but the whole environmental devastation of the planet in a solution of continued partition of Palestine. We see this in Ireland in the growing response to the COVID crisis as well, uh, the growth of a, a one island approach to, to COVID. Uh, it's, it's, it's impossible to address this in the context of continued partition and separation. Uh, and I wonder to what extent the, the, one, um, the one democratic state uh, movement has taken this on a board and how they're addressing this. Well, we do use the word sustainability in our program. And it, it, the last couple points in our program have to do with uh, our responsibilities towards the region to uh, to working with progressive forces in the Arab world and the Muslim world, and then of course, globally. Um, you know, a lot of this relates to my last book that is really more relevant to some of you than, than this book. The, in other words, the war against the people is really how Israel is, uh, is encouraging and, and contributing to a global capitalism. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very anti, I mean, it really, it, you know, it's anti-capitalist, obviously, but it really shows uh, how Israel um, is an enforcer, you know, that uh, Israel, you know, sp uh, spans um, a military uh, security policing continuum more than any other country. In other words, it's, it's highly sophisticated in the, the most cutting edge forms of warfare. You know, 60% of the world's drones are Israelis and very high tech equipments and, 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 and so on. But at the same time, you know, its laboratory is the palace, is the occupied territory. So it knows very well how to deal with actual people and controlling movements and fighting so-called terrorism and all of that. So if you're a government, if you're the British government or the American government with your huge military, you know, Israel can, can, can be very useful for you in, in a lot of ways. One of, you know, for example, just give me one example, you know, the F-35, which is a super sophisticated stealth bomber, the new one Americans have. I mean, Israel could never build something like that. It's way beyond its capacity. But the cockpit of the F-35 is largely Israeli. A lot of the navigation, a lot of the imagery, a lot of the targeting systems um, yeah, are Israeli. So, you know, uh, you know, even a sophisticated uh, uh, army like the U.S. really uses Israel, you know, uh, in, a, in a major way. But all repressive regimes all over the world use because Israel it trains its police, it trains its security services, it trains its presidential guards. And, and it really shows, you know, really, they work with the Saudis, you know, they work with the, uh, with the Egyptians in terms of uh, repressing their own people, not to mention Burma, Myanmar, which uh, Israel is the only country that exports arms there. And the junta has shown off Israeli, uh, uh, for example, patrol boats and its Navy and so on. Israel, you know, Israel, after Russia, Israel's the, the largest arms supplier of China and India. So, you know, 
so that Israel's become to some degree the enforcer of global, oh, that's what I'm saying of global, uh, of global capitalism. It has, I think Israel has a reach in terms of the military security policing much greater than the US. You know, the US has 170 some bases uh, all around the world. But you know, these are military bases. They fly in and out in certain countries. But Israel has a deep penetration, not only into the army, but into your internal security services, into your police forces, you know, into your a, a corporations that are dealing with security stuff, your economy, in virtually every country in the world. There's almost no country, maybe except Iran, that you don't have a real Israeli presence. I wouldn't be so sure about Iran. Um, so, so you know, it's really, it's really amazing. And so in a way, you know, if you wanna check, if you wanna uh, see how capitalism is oppressive and how it enforces itself and so on, in a way it's much more useful to look at a little country like Israel. It has to scramble and identify markets and identify niches and, and fill them and so on. If you want to understand the dynamics of capitalism, instead of looking at a behama, at a, at a huge uh, country like the US, they can just, well, you know, uh, trample, uh, trample itself around the world. So, you know, I think in terms of, um, of that, I, I use a concept called global Palestine. And that is that in many ways, Israel over Palestine is a microcosm of the global north over the global south in all kinds of ways. And I think it's something, uh, it's something worth, uh, worth looking into. So, I mean, for those of you really interested in, in Palestine, hopefully this book I just published, you know, will be useful for you. But those that are more inclined to anti-capitalism, I think war against the people would be, I think you really find that useful. Thank you, Jeff. I, I think that Simon is going to speak uh, as a question. I don't know if anybody else has got a question, they can put their hands up while Simon is speaking. Thank you, Amber. Um, Jeff, as a uh, political activist, do you, you have to have hope. Uh, hope that um, uh, in the battle of ideas, your ideas will um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, people will take them on board. Um, how have you remained so resilient over the years and, and have uh, kept uh, going in, in what is a, a, a struggle that, that, that has um, is a very, it's been very hard? Um, so, so could you just talk to, to maybe a, a younger activist who, who uh, maybe um, start on this road and then give up because it, it is a difficult one? But what, what would you say? Well, first of all, you use two contradictory terms in one sentence. <laughs> because I don't deal in hope. I don't believe in hope. Hope is a religious concept that's, you know, but, you know, people in power don't hope to be in power. <laughs> they, they work at it, you know, they got a strategy. You know, corporations didn't hope to run the world. And, uh, and so I, I, you know, the other word you use is a word that I think is important, and that is struggle. We're in a struggle. And uh, with a struggle, you understand from the very term that, that it's tough, <laughs> you know, that it's not uh, some, something that's going to happen, you know, uh, be resolved tomorrow morning. You're in a struggle and struggles are struggles and, 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 and you have to prevail. Um, and uh, <clears throat> from my point of view, what we're lacking in the left, I, yeah, I'll say, you know, I, I really feel this on the, in the left all over the world. That is that we don't see ourselves as political actors. You know, I think we don't believe that we can really change policy or influence policy or do any of the stuff we talk about. So we, we're very articulate. We write well, we speak well. And we do our protests and we have our, 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 you know, Zoom groups and all that stuff. But we're not organized. We're not strategic. And we're all siloed. In other words, everybody's in, in their own particular struggle. So there's no, I mean, there, there really is no, I mean, the World Social Forum was an attempt to try to create a forum that would bring all the groups together and strategize, but it, that's sort of died. 
Um, I've been working on a kind of a project that I call the People Yes Project um, to bring together less groups all over the world. But that it, it's 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 I don't have to tell you guys it's super hard to work with the left. We don't work with each other. We're a herd of we're a, a herd of cats. So uh, so from my point of view, what depresses me isn't the struggle. I think we can win the struggle. What depresses me is we're not organized, we have no plan, and we have no strategy. What we do have, which is important, is an analysis. I mean, all of us together, if we put our heads together, you know, all the different uh, issues around the world, I think we have, we, have a we have an analysis that's fairly coherent. We don't, it's not articulated in one particular place, but, but you can, there is an anti-capitalist, environmental, social justice, um, you know, multicultural kind of, a, kind of an analysis out there. So that's not the problem. The problem is how do you organize it? And, and what kind of a plan do you have to offer people? And, and what strategy do you have to move it forward? So we really don't, we don't reach out and speak to the public very well. We have our own jargon. We've got our own, you know, way of talking and we don't, we don't try to, to, you know, like the right wing does. I mean, the right wing uses, and now it might be easier for them because they have flags and they have God and they have all this emotional stuff that at their service, you know, that we don't have, but you know, we should, think more about our strategies of communication because I really believe that most people in the world are on our side. Like most people in the world, including probably Trump supporters <laughs> or Tories, you know, most people want a good education. They want democracy. They want a good life. They want a clean planet. I mean, they, but they just don't see the way there and they, they, you know, and so they're more easily convinced by the right because the right has a compelling and an understandable worldview. You know, it's easy to, it's easy to pick up. Uh, and so I think our job is harder, but that means that we have to organize better and be more strategic. And uh, if we, you know, and that's what depresses me, when we're not strategic, we lose. If we were strategic, I think we would be much further ahead in the struggle, and I think we can win the struggle. So uh, I think my generation's starting to peter out, and it's your generation that's got to pick up that mantle, and uh, and we'll see, you know, if something changes. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Jeff. Uh, Simon, uh, can you please sum up and talk about uh, the books and again about and about the uh, anti capitalist resistance? Okay. Yeah, um, so um, thank you, Jeff, uh, for uh, coming this evening to speak to us. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you here. Um, it's been an enlightening uh, conversation. Um, just a reminder to everyone, um, our friends at Pluto Press have given us a 30% discount on Jeff's latest uh, work. Uh, the links are in the chat, uh, so if you um, save the uh, chat at the end of uh, this evening's discussion you'll be able to click on the link and, and get Jeff's book um, so uh, yeah uh, and also the uh, the other book as well is also uh, from Pluto Press as well so that'd be really good um, uh, so this evening's talk has been hosted by Anti-Capitalist Resistance um, we ha have uh, a number of events coming up um, our next uh, talk is on the 18th of March which will be on uh, democracy in Hong Kong um, we also have uh, Critical University, which we uh, hold on a Saturday. Uh, and the next one of those um, is on, I'm going to have to have a quick look because I can't remember, 20th of March, I think it is. Yes, it's the 20th of March. 20th of March. Um, and that one will be on uh, women and the pandemic. Um, so please do sign up for that. The, uh, the first uh, one we had was uh, very well received. Um, uh, and then we have a, a regular um, reading group as well uh, with the Left Book Club. And the next one of those is on the 22nd of March. Um, and that uh, book is Class Power on Zero Hours by the Angry Workers. So um, uh, if, if you've uh, reading that and you, and you want to discuss it, then please do join us. Um, and uh, if, like I said at the beginning, if you like um, our website, you like what we stand for, we are very welcoming to new members. 
um, uh, anti-capitalist resistance is uh, the start of something. Um, it's socialist resistance, uh, collaborating with mutiny. Um, and obviously, uh, as Jeff alluded to, we would love to uh, bring other left groups, other left thinkers uh, together uh, because um, strength comes through unity. Um, and the more of us that there are sharing ideas and, and uh, campaigning together, uh, the better that would be. Um, so um, please do uh, consider joining us uh, and taking part uh, and um, uh, it'd be good to have you. So uh, thank you again for um, coming along this evening. Thank you to Jeff. Thank you thank to you. Roland uh, for starting the discussion. And thank you to Imbar for chairing as well. Um, and uh, like I say, um, thank you all for coming. It's been a pleasure. Excellent. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Jeff. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <coughs>